like to let you watch the gadgets and things to look at. So we continue our journey. Come to the time of the sermon, the message. Our journey we've been on is we've been studying the leading causes of life. Part of this came out of the fact that every time you turn on the news, it's talking about death and destruction and violence and, and pain and suffering. So we wanted to pour some of our energy into what leads to life. And today we're talking about blessing. Now, as I was reading, it became clear to me that we cannot bless ourselves. Blessings don't work that way. We receive blessings from God through those things I was just talking to the kids about. And then we can bless other people. But we can't bless ourselves. A lot of people try. And it simply turns into an exercise, a self-seeking exercise of gratification of want. You know, we think of the things in our lives that we want. And some of them might be needs, but does the want kind of rise up to the top? And we think, oh, if I'm blessed, I'm going to get all the things I want. Well, our culture, I blame our culture, has taught us to live in that kind of mindset by training us to, to think that we could do that, that we could bless ourselves. We hear, we hear things like, you deserve the very best. We've all heard that. Or, have it your way. Uh, one of my favorites that I am trying to eschew is, life's short, eat dessert first. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that putting our own wants in, in first. We hear a lot of it, especially this time of year, as the, the engine has started, that buying engine for gearing up for Christmas. They're trying to get us to think of buying this and, oh, buy yourself a gift. Yeah, okay. That's not how it's supposed to be. And we cannot, ultimately, we cannot find satisfaction and blessing by aiming to please ourselves first. That's not how blessing works. More often, we find that we're blessed after some sort of a struggle. The way that Jacob was blessed after wrestling with God. God blesses us only when we're open to God's presence. When we're availing ourselves. God blesses those who are willing to answer that knocking at the door. One of my favorite stained glass windows in the church I grew up in is that picture of Jesus knocking door, you know, the big wooden door that our church had. I'm really dating myself, I know. But it's only when we're willing to open that door in response to that knock that we really can connect and be blessed. God blesses us even when we're asking questions for which there are no easy answers. Just in the asking of the we find ourselves plugging in to the source, the one who has those answers, ultimately, that's when we get connected. That's when we find ourselves being blessed. When we plug into the source of all that the world is not. Eternal, unchanging, and omnipotent. Those are the things. Yeah, I showed the kids. I love my electronic devices. They help me keep track of my life. If something happens to, to them, I'm just praying that they're, they're backed up to each other. They're supposed to do that. And they're backed up in the cloud, so if somebody steals one, I replace it. And you can download the calendar. It's still there. It's all good. And I don't hesitate to give out my cell number because if you really want to talk to the pastor, that's the surest, quickest way. And thank you. None of you have ever abused that service. I want you to have access. I publish my cell number. The only problem with the, those devices is that they do require charging. We need that source of energy. And we humans, we need that source of energy that comes from God. We need that spiritual connection. We need to plug into God on a regular basis. And I believe that this happens best when we worship. Now, what we've got to remember is that worship is not only 
what we do in this building on Sunday morning. Worship is a way of life. It may begin here in the gathered body of Christ where we learn the stories of the Bible, we learn about Jesus, and and we celebrate together what Jesus did for us. And we praise and we sing and we pray and we hear the inspired word of God read and expounded upon. But for it to really recharge us and connect our hearts to the one we worship, we need to continue to worship throughout the week. Worship is a lifestyle more than it is an event. Worship is a regular, steady connection to our Creator, our source of life, the one who sustains us, the one who called, I almost said himself, it's way more than himself or herself, it's the great I am, the ground of all being. That's who we have to connect with. And if we can do that, even if it's only for the shortest of instant, we can see a miracle. Human beings tend to think that blessings are rewards that feel good. Okay, well, tell Jacob that when he was younger. Yeah, he was blessed, but it didn't feel so good. Just the way people in Jesus' day had their own mental picture of what the Messiah was going to look like and what he was going to do when he came, we have to have a mental image of what qualifies as a blessing. It's going to make us richer, thinner, and better looking is what most people think of when they think of blessing. Because that's what the world has taught us to think. That this is what success looks like. This is what happiness looks like. We're rich, we're thin, we want for nothing. We're good. But that's not how God works. At least not in my experience. The Beatitudes gives us Jesus' definition of what it looks like to deserve and receive a blessing. Now I'm going to read today not from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, but from the message version, because I love how Eugene Peterson went back to the original Greek and translated it the way you and I talk today. So listen to the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions, and this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud of owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourself cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart, put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's plan. You're blessed when you, your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecuted persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, Count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit you. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all have an applause and you know you're in good company. 
my prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Isn't that awesome? It's not the kind of blessings we thought. There was a moment for me the other day when I received one of those kinds of blessings. I was feeling stressed out over the, some changes that came about this week, changes in my life, in the life of the church, changes that I had not initiated or anticipated. Yes, even your pastor feels stressed out sometimes over things. I know it, it makes everybody anxious, but that's the way it is. And the Spirit reminded me of one of the verses that I had just read that morning, one that I just read to you, the one that says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. (laughs) I was feeling like I was at the end of my rope. You're blessed then because there's less of you and more of God and His rule. And there are times when we truly feel like, oh, Lord, I'm hanging on by a thread here. I don't know what to do. It's in those moments when we feel we have no control. Yeah, that's the thing. Control, right? Yeah. We feel drained and depleted and, and just without hope. But it's then, if we remember to call on God, operative word if, change that to when, first call on God for the strength and the courage and the help. And We'll receive it. We'll receive it. It might come in a way we didn't imagine. It might come from a different direction than we anticipated. But it is then that we are, when we are most open to God's blessing. Because we feel like we've got nothing left. No answers, no energy. And that's when we're blessed. It's then when we remember to call on God when we remember that we can trust God to see us through, that the Lord will show us the way. And when he has done it, <laughs> we are blessed with the way when we could see no way. That's what God is all about. Out of our darkness comes his light. The second opportunity that times like this brings comes when we see someone else that is in a tough situation. And the Lord nudges us to do something, to speak a word of encouragement, to to supply a need, to, to share from our resources, to do whatever it is that God has equipped us to do. Even if it means praying for our enemies. Help us to find a way. That was my prayer. We're able to be a blessing to others. And God blesses us so that we can turn around and share those blessings. The more we're blessed, the more he expects us to be a blessing to other people. Even the poorest people on earth can be a blessing. Time and again, people who have gone on mission trips come back and they tell me the story of having been to a third world country like Haiti or Honduras, someplace where they are serving the poorest of the poor. And they're in somebody's home and their hosts prepare them a meal that quite literally has them cooking and serving every ounce of food on the shelf. And they're just taken aback because it's like, I can't eat this. This is all you have, and yet you're giving it to me. So they know that they have to eat the meal because it would be an insult not to. And at the same time, they're wondering, what are they going to eat tomorrow? And it is that outrageous, awesome sense of radical hospitality that teaches these first world missionaries what it is to feel blessed. That their hosts feel so blessed that it's an honor to be able to to cook them a meal. That's 
not something many of us have ever experienced here in America. We, we have this mindset of, you know, saving some back, just in case. Yeah, that radical hospitality, that total, total trust in God is something that most Americans should learn a lesson from. Get much better. When we worship with everything we have and everything we are, we can experience something that money cannot buy. When we bless someone else, we too receive a blessing. And it's a circle thing. It goes unbroken if we don't stop and break that circle with our own sense of scarcity or stinginess or short-sightedness. Those things lead to death. Death of relationships, death of joy, death of, of family, death of peace. It brings be connected to God and connected to one another. That leads to life. To live lives filled with coherence, meaning you have a, a sense of purpose and meaningfulness. You get up in the morning and you feel like, I got good stuff to offer the world and here's what I'm going to do. That gives you a sense of, wow, God needs me. That's called a sense of agency. That you're doing all the good you can, not because it makes you feel good, but because that's what God called you to do. Those kind of feelings, that leads to life. To receive God's blessings, even the wrestling and limping away kind of blessings, and then to find a way to use them, to bless somebody else, that leads to life too. Eternal life, as well as life here and now. There was a Christian Christian mystic. Her name is Teresa of Avila. She once said, the whole way to heaven is heaven itself. The whole way to heaven is heaven itself. Each blessing we give and receive is a glimpse of heaven. A glimpse of that place that Jesus suggested was already present. Already in us. Not just some far off end time place, but already here. Even though sometimes now it feels very, very far away. People who call themselves spiritual but long, not religious also long for this place, this place of belonging to the kind of community where we do live in peace, where we can live free from fear, free from violence, free from injustice. Oh, what a blessing that would be. In order for us to experience that kind of heavenly community, we must learn to connect ourselves to God through worship. Worship that's appropriately filled with a sense of awe and wonder. We've lost that sense of Shock and awe changed the meaning of the word in carnage. To stand in awe of God. The Old Testament used in the fear of God, but it, it's more appropriately interpreted awe and, and wondrous, astounded reverence for God. To connect in worship every day look out the window and you see that one last tree that's got leaves that are still bright gold and shining and all the rest of the trees are just dead. That's all. To, to hear the cry of a newborn baby in the sky. Think of the millions of chemical reactions that happen perfectly to create that baby. Worship. And it goes beyond the walls of this building. It goes beyond Sunday morning out into our homes and our workplaces and our schools and our hospitals and every bit of life. It can be an act of worship. Worship that permeates our culture and infuses it with grace. That's what America needs. That's the whole world. A sense of bringing God's 
grace contains forgiveness, both accepting it and giving it. Grace is accepting rather than judgmental. Grace is something that we can only really know when we've accepted it from God. And once we have, we're free, standing, wonder, and awe all over again. And that's when we can say, be a blessing, the kind of blessing that's needed, but it's not within our human power to give it, is it? We don't have control. That kind of blessing we have to first receive from God. We have to be the conduit of that blessing, and once we've received it, then we can give it. So we have to be connected to God. God is the only power and the only one that can do that. We have to surrender to the love of God in Christ and receive God's blessing. Worship is a participatory act. It's not something that can simply be watched. It's different. We cannot be consumers of worship. We have to take part in order for it to really be the blessing that God hopes it will be. We come into a, into worship with a mindset that has to be different than, the, say, we're going to a play or to a movie. We can't just sit and watch and expect to, to be blessed. We have to actually take part in it in order to be inspired. At the same time of participating we have to know how to be still. Most of it is stillness up here, quieting our mind, stopping that ongoing conversation that says, well, at uh, at 22, she's 20 minutes before the end of her service, and I'm going here for lunch, and i, I got to go to the grocery store and pick up X, Y, and Z. No. Calm all of that. Be still. to receive that blessing, we've got to let God breathe into us and fill us with the sense that we are connected somehow to the great God that we serve. To do that, to truly worship, requires, we can say work, but effort, I'll call it. Because work, some people don't want to work. They, they want it just to be easy. But we have to make the effort to do it. It's not just requires openness and mindfulness. It requires being open to the Holy Spirit. Now, my husband Tom and I have been married for 26 years. And not all 26 years have been fabulous. I'll be quite honest. But we've learned how to commune with each other. And one of the things we were taught was when you are feeling anxious, and you need that other person to be especially sensitive, we've learned to ask that other person to put our antenna up. Put up your antenna, please. Now, yeah, that meant a lot back in the days when people used antennas on their radios and televisions and things. We live in a wireless world. But still, we can we get the idea. You, you have to put up your antenna to receive the signal that Communicate that pays attention to where that person is right now. And in this age of wireless and cell phones, we still have cell towers. If you live close to Lake Michigan, you learn that cell signals don't travel well over large bodies of water. So there's still places where there's no signal. So we have to connect. We have to be mindful of what it is to, to connect with God and to connect with other people somehow. This week, I invite you to put your antenna up, to listen for God, to connect with God in prayer, in worship, in your home, in your car, who 
when you're stopped at the stoplight, maybe don't close your eyes to the purple spray because you'll have people honking at you and the lights will be green. But use those moments to pray. Pray out of remember the scripture when you're feeling the chest pain that says, Blessed are you when you use the name of the Lord. Lord God, put your intention, put your hand on the spirit of the Lord. Some of you have done purple prayer cards. Uh, these are the prayers you have lifted up for people in our community. Um, in the, the welcome packet thing, there's a prayer list, too. And I jumped the gun. Um, Bill Dunham's surgery is not this week. It's a week from. 